Brought to you by Tiger B. Ford. Hello, orthopedic ambassadors. Welcome to Inside Orthopedics. My name is Tiger. I'm an orthopedic industry insider and retained recruiter for early stage orthopedic companies. Thanks for listening. This is episode number 19, titled A First Conversation with the Founder of Micro C, Dr. Greg Kolovich. This one is for those who want to look inside an early startup. Greg is a fellowship-trained hand surgeon in Georgia and co-founder of MicroC, a handheld C-arm that is just faster, clearer, and safer than the C-arm in your operating room today. Miram is his chief marketing officer for the MicroC business. This is a candid conversation between Greg Kolovich, Miram Sharp, and myself. We are in three separate locations after Academy in March of 2019. We have never met. You will see from the awkwardness at the beginning of the conversation that this is a first time. Enjoy. Don't forget to subscribe and thank Tiger Buford when you have a key addition to your team. Be safe out there. So let's just jump right in. Let's just go live here. Um, so first of all, I guess tell you know tell me who you are and and kind of how you ended up in Savannah. So my name is Greg Kolovich. I'm an orthopedic surgeon in Savannah, working with Optum Orthopedics. I um, from Cleveland, Ohio. I went to med school at Ohio State after my undergrad at Georgia Tech, and in my residency training, my residency at Ohio State, my um, hand and micro fellowship at, at Harvard at Mass General. So my wife is from Atlanta, and she always wanted to move back south. What's interesting about the group at Optum is that three of the guys had gone through the same residency program as me, so when they were looking for a hand surgeon, they knew who just to call, and they, they called me directly and recruited me down. Obviously, my wife was ecstatic by moving back to Georgia, and that's how I ended up in Savannah. When I was makes, makes first moved to Savannah, I... I didn't know what to make of Savannah when I first moved, and now I love it. I remember when anywhere else I really adapted to mm-hmm. living on the water and boating and golfing and, you know, the cool low country lifestyle. It's very, um, a great place to raise a family. And I live right on Skiway Island, and I've got three kids. So, well, it's a great place to, to raise kids. And you guys just had your giant St. Patrick's Day parade, I guess. We did. I, I missed it, fortunately. <laughs> we were in <laughs> we got back from the... Oh, from I usually leave town for that. Oh, yeah, I got back um, Saturday night, so... All right, terrific. Um, so uh, let's just, let's kind of jump right in. So I'm I'm an engineer. I think you're an engineer, too. I love to hear about where ideas come from. So what's the, where was the aha moment for the micro well, the aha, the aha moment was very, <laughs> I mean, I can remember like it was yesterday, I was doing a case, the guy in, he was in Nantucket, and he, he, he cut his hand off with a chop saw wow. in a suicide attempt. So then he, you know, he had a lot of mental issues. He ran off in, into the woods. His wife, his wife found him. They flew him up to uh, Mass General, and I, I put his hand on as a fellow. And I remember... Um, I remember having trouble, like, you know, plating a wrist or plating, plating the hand and holding the C-arm. And I kept thinking, God, it would be great if I could just untether this thing, you know. You're trying to lug this 400-pound C-arm around, and you're holding an, a hand unsteady, and you're trying to put screws into the metacarpal and screws into the wrist. And, you know, you're doing it by yourself at night. So I remember, I remember it was like 3 or 4 in the morning, and I, and I thought, got it. You know, if I could untether the emitter with the with the sensor, that would be something. You know, if I could get closer, it basically was about degrees of freedom. If I could have the infinite degrees of freedom and bring the X-ray to the target, as opposed to bringing the target to the X-ray, then that was the aha moment. So I went, uh, you know, after I immediately like the, the, the wheel started turning in my head. I was actually on a ferry 
to Martha's Vineyard, and I, I wrote down a uh, sort of a circuit and a, and a prototype on a napkin. It was like an hour ferry ride. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was about a half hour ferry ride. But I remember I was I was I was outside as the sun was going down. I was writing this thing on a napkin, and then I uh, I was electrical engineer, so I called my buddy down in, in Georgia Tech. And I asked him if it was possible. I started doing research on it, and then we started really cranking out some cool ideas. And then um, it was funny when we came up for the table, the tracking. Um, the original plan was to have a static sensor flat on the on the table, and then a movable emitter. Okay. And I thought, well, why couldn't we just get a really big, you know, flat panel CMOS detector? Like a like a twenty four by twenty four and just have the whole table be a, a giant detector. <laughs> and my, my CEO, Evan Ruff, he's like, Greg, those panels are hundred and eighty thousand dollars. <laughs> well so um my so like, well that's out because we can never sell a mini C arm for the panel cost of we can never sell a thing that, that costs hundred and eighty five thousand dollars just just for one part. I mean the right. thing would be incredibly expensive. So out of sheer monetary necessity, we, we thought of a design to make it cheaper, and that is use a six by six panel, which is about six thousand dollars. You know, don't you don't have to quote me on these numbers, but um, sure. the uh, the panel was was exponentially cheaper, and instead of having one panel, much like a panorama, we could move the panel in space and stitch the pictures together. So you could cover the entire table with one hmm. smaller panel. So that's how we came up with the tracking, which is actually like now that we're, you know, two and a half years into it, that's the part that all the big, big companies want is our tracking because we could build that into OR tables now. So, um, what what was an idea to make it affordable became probably one of the most desirable intellectual properties that we've created was our, was our tracking. So we've developed a way to track a sensor and a table through drapes and through the interference of the uh, anesthesia machine. So, um, and we developed a very specific technique, uh, and we laid claims to that and have IP all surrounded about that. And then we've also developed, you know, when you're moving in infinite degrees of space, you have to collimate your your conical X-ray beam so that it's focused on the on the um, target. You can't be shooting X-rays in, in, you know, in a, into oblivion. So we needed to a very specific way how to focus the beam. So we developed this dynamic collimator, which shapes the beam in particular, shapes the, the and, and always directs it at the, the sensor. So the sensor and the emitter talk in space and they move in space, so they're always perpendicular. And the wow. collimator shapes the beam, shapes the beam so that it's always, you know, maximally focused on the sensor. So those are the two real big parts. So once we figured out how to do that, then the ideas just came, you know, we patented all that. And then we came up with all this other stuff, like, you know, like stuff I, I really can't even get into because um, it's the future generation of, uh, of our company. And when we started spinning off these ideas, we're like, well, micro-C is our baby. Micro-C is, is, is what people want. Micro-C is probably what people are going to want to buy or, or sell or acquire. But we have all these other ideas for IP. We're creating a new company called Oxos Medical, which will be our C corporation, and then Micro okay. C will have its own own part of it. So got it. We had to do that. We had to do that to protect our ideas, so that for future iterations, you know, we still have a, a corporation going. So we've morphed from this two-person company to a company with. We have 15 full employees, 21 contractors. We've got a lot of traction. We've raised millions of dollars um, from about over 60 doctors. And uh, we have not gone D.C. yet, which okay. I, think is, I think is a very good thing. But people like you who say things like, ah, oh, you're solving a problem. When you see it, and you know, your experience with orthopedics, imagine what – and surgeons are saying about it when they see it in action for the first time, or they oh, get first X-ray. It has to sell itself. So yeah, yeah. It not only sells itself, but they're like, "How do we be a part of it?" And then you know they they become investors as well. So wow. we've been very very blessed with a lot of traction, 
Um, we, we've got some really good ideas for the future in terms of embedding our technology into operating tables and creating new OR of the future that is without a C-arm and without a C-arm tech. Um, and, and doing a lot of uh, AI platforms to start interpreting radiology images um, automat automatically without radiology input and to do a lot of templating and annotations on the x-ray to make to make x-rays more efficient and and, uh, and and certainly like cheaper to more automated right right so the secret sauce is the is it's the software that connects the sensor with the emitter and and it keeps them parallel to each other well the secret sauce is um i mean it's you can read our patent. It has to do with our tracking. Okay. So it is. It, it, it's it's a hardware track. I mean, it shoots. It's it's lidar, which is sort of how, uh, you know, it's sort of how um, self-driving cars work. Right. Right. So it, it laser. It has these. Right. It's actually high. It's actually infrared. Infrared. But, right. Uh, and, and we've been able to create a system that can penetrate the drapes because you got to drape over it, so it's not a direct line of sight. We've actually tested it with 17 drapes, and it still tracks through the drapes. We've also had to create a system that, that wasn't – so if you start thinking about, well, how are you going to track two things in space? Well, there's a lot of ways you can do that. You can do that with Bluetooth. You can do that with Wi-Fi. You can do a direct cable access. Uh, you could do ultrasound. You could do infrared. So there's all these ideas. You just throw a bunch of ideas up on a whiteboard. Well, then, unfortunately, we don't – you have to cut 90% of those ideas out because you don't have direct line of sight. Right. We don't have, we have to drape over our table. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't, we couldn't do like, because of that sheer fact, we had to cut out many of the ideas. And then because we're in a, we're in basically a silo that is, has very important machines, our anesthesia machine, plus all the other interference going on with the OR. Um, we, we, we couldn't use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth that wasn't fast enough or reliable. So we needed something that was could certainly track through without a direct line of sight, but it had to be faster and more reliable than Bluetooth or, or uh, Wi-Fi because we, could, we couldn't do that with all the interference in the room. So right. we, were, we were lucky enough to – well, we were smart enough. I don't want to say lucky because this was actually took a lot of – a lot of thinking on our part to, to come up with a system that that could handle both those those obstacles. One, you got to be able to do it in a very pressure cooked situation, such as the OR, with a lot of interference. Number two, you got to do it blindly without any direct line of sight. So we did. We were able to do both. So would so that, five, would five G help solve the problem in the future with with Bluetooth and Wi-Fi? Oh, see, I'm not, I'm not smart enough to answer that. That's probably a question that that Evan and our software engineers can answer. But I think, um, you know, I, that's a question I can't answer. But certainly, it makes things, you know, faster with less um, resistance, less interference. Um, you know, I, I think I think they're starting to get. They're starting to make things that we only dreamed about when I was in school, when I was in engineering school. So Right, right. Uh, well, so I've seen pictures. It's like the size of an iron. I mean, it's tiny. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's uh, totally portable, and you can get, get close to the space really easy. So what's the power source? Is it just uh, AC or DC in the operating room? <laughs> and, and both sides tethered? Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's uh, 110 volts, AC. Okay. Um, so we're, ha we're, we're all, everything's custom. We have a customized power, a custom power supply, a custom uh, X-ray tube. Um, we believe we can make everything smaller. Um, there's a couple companies that that have smaller parts, like our. Uh, we believe we can build smaller power supply and a smaller X-ray tube. Wow. And that can go up to 120 kV, so that we can power through a hip and a spine. Wow! So that's that's our that's our next goal to make it even more powerful and smaller. We think we can probably knock off another pound. Um, I mean, you know, you start thinking about this, and and you, in, in after a year or so, you get to know every manufacturer in the world. 
And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, and those guys come up with something they're the first to know about it. So we're, we're probably getting um, we're light years ahead in terms of of contracting with with people out there that can that can make us really small and and, and help us miniaturize um, our, our our emitter. Um, we are even working with manufacturers to make. Uh, um, we really even want to talk about making a faster, even better flat panel detector. Um, you know, that's a very expensive part of it. It's a very expensive um, piece. Those 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 flat panel detectors take a long time to make. There's zero tolerance for error, so they take months and months to to, to make. And, wow. and and those are those are super expensive. Yeah, the process is really really intricate. It's not like they just pound those things out day by day. They take they take a long time to make. So, and they can't have any defects. And if there's any defect in the lattice, then they have to throw them out. So there's very um, those are very very uh, complicated pieces to make. And we've learned a lot about digital radiography through that. So wow. Our hope our hope is to sort of not that I ever want to get in the process of making flat panel detectors, but we want to find contractors <laughs> that can sort of sort of um, you know make things specifically for us uh, in terms of what we want to do. Um, and well, it, once it should you, be very powerful when you can do those things. Yeah, once you get the volume, you can dictate to the suppliers uh, your turn right. a better. Yeah. Right. Well, so where, so where is the Micro-C right now? What's the Where's the design and the regulatory uh, approach? Good question. So we froze the design February 18th. Uh, when when you freeze your design, then it goes for IEC testing. So we have five um, uh, prototypes that are being tested. They do they do a lot of things. They drop test them. They you know they shock them with a thousand bolts. Uh, they test mm-hmm. them underwater. I mean, yeah, they, water test, the shower test. I, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> They do they do a lot of crazy things that you're thinking, well, why would this ever happen in the OR? Now, at first I was like, well, this is just absurd. But now that we're in the thick of it, I'm I'm very glad that we're doing it because number one, it it it, it ensures me that our device is truly indestructible, at least within the confines of an OR. And I know yeah. if it can pass IET testing, it can pass the OR. Number well, two, it makes you really think about safety. <laughs> in an extreme way and how important it is for others. So I'm actually glad that we're doing it. Plus it puts up a ton of hurdles for people to knock it off. I mean, right. you know, you always, you always want to make your technology difficult to replicate and the safety features that we've added, the lockout, all the, I mean, essentially, you know, we had to build in a safety feature so that if it gets shocked with a thousand volts, it shuts off so it doesn't cook our motherboard and then hmm. turns back on. Wow. So, I mean that those are those are those are embedded into our motherboard. I mean we we had to build those things, and it was a learning process. No one ever tells you that when you're designing your motherboard from day one, be sure that it's capable for a thousand foot transient shock. I mean, no one ever tells you that. You learn that <laughs> as you go in IEC testing. So, like I said, if I if I had to do it all over again, I would probably start at the end and then go back to the beginning. If you know what I mean. Yeah. Like look at what the the, the start with the, the test in mind. Yeah. Right, right, but but we're here and we made it very good progress within two years. No one thought that we would get to this point in two years, <laughs> including myself. So I'm it's really fast, right? lucky. I mean, really fast solving problems when you've got multiple engineering disciplines, you mechanical, electrical, software. Amazing. Yeah, and I think so. We, so we've submitted for IEC testing. We should have FDA uh, coming up. Um, I mean, soon we're, think, we're thinking at two, three of this year. Okay. Oh. Next one. Uh, and there's software. There's embedded software, or is there? Can you talk to the device from somewhere else? Can you upgrade software from somewhere else? Yeah, that's that, in modern technology. That's all that, that has that has to be part of it. I mean, you, you have to be able to do. Um, you know, upgrades for process process upgrades uh, from afar because right. there's no way we could we could send a 
distributor to each one and, and upgrade it. So it's simply a matter of, of up, like, sort of as your iPhone. Um, we built it into the software where it upgrades on its own. Oh, brilliant. That's brilliant. Wow. What was the biggest challenge in the last two years? What was, you know, all startups hit walls and have really tough problems to solve, but what was your big problem? Um, well, I remember back, was it 2016? I was actually on a flight to Dublin. Uh, we were going to Ireland, and Evan was in Atlanta, and we were having we were having a lot of trouble with uh, power supply and the heating and cooling of the X-ray tube. Mm-hmm. And we, we we didn't think we could we could get it done. We we thought it was actually sort of impossible to have uh, a 60 kV tube at that size with that tolerance for what we need to do. So we didn't and, and then get the power supply into it. Um, and we were on our third or fourth iteration. We had talked to X-ray suppliers from all over the world, and I was we were pretty frustrated with each other. I flew out to England, and Evan and I had set up this meeting with this guy out of the UK. He was actually in, in London time, and it was probably at three or four in the morning for me. I don't remember what time it was for Evan, and I, I think England was like at the same time zone. But we had this huge conference call for about a, an hour or two, and we sort of figured it out. Wow. And that was really that was really early because at that point we were like, well, if we can't figure this part out, you're, you're dead. And yeah. That, and at that point, it was all my money into it, and it was like my close, like my, you know, like my father-in-law's money. It was like these were like these were like this was like family money, you know. So like I was wow. like, it, it was basically me taking all the risk at that point. So that was a big hurdle. Um, you know. We've been blessed with raising money. I think I think Evan and I have a certain capacity to to level with investors. I, I think people have found us to be credible and trustworthy. So we, we haven't had trouble raising money, which has been a really good thing. We haven't we've never run out of money. And as my my good friend Josh Hicks says, Josh sold his company plated to Albertsons for three hundred million dollars. So he's a very trustworthy guy. He knows what he's talking about. And he said, Greg, you can only run out of money once. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you can only run out of money once if you're a startup. Yeah. And if you do it again, it won't happen again. So yeah. I I remember I I remember um thinking about stuff like that and, and, and the first year was tough. I remember there had been a lot of sleepless nights. Uh especially when we were on you know on the drawing board and um just having like delays and stuff we were like getting the prototype made and it wasn't it was, they weren't major delays but like to me they were you know because I was, yeah well you're you know, burning you're burning cash every month it's it's painful you're burning you're burning cash and, and you're you know you're you think it you, you think it you got the perfect idea and you go down that path and it it's not that it wasn't perfect it just is not it wasn't practical or it wasn't like affordable you know what I mean so yeah you're always kind of making these adjustments on on the way, but like I think I think the one thing that that we've been very good at, Evan and I are polar opposites. So like you know, when he's hot, I keep him cool. When I'm hot, he keeps me cool. So <laughs> we have just very different ways of dealing with stuff. So I think I think um, he's always been very good at like delegating responsibility to our um, import, like to our engineers and keeping them on track and making sure that they're working at capacity. So he's been really good at managing that. I've been really good at managing our investors' expectations and then sort of pushing the vision of the product to the end user, which is me. So we had very different talents with very different responsibilities. But I think that took a lot of pressure off him uh, in the day to day, because I, I, I mainly deal with the fundraising and, and the investing and, and, and on the trade shows and, and you know, pitching it and, and that sort of thing. And then he was able to do the day to day as a CEO and get the project done and meet deadlines. So, and we've never, we've ever, we have a, a saying like, we've learned from like, you know, Theranos and all these other companies that, no, we're, we're just doing stuff that, that, you know, promising things they couldn't deliver. We, we've been very careful not to do that. We've only, we only, we know what we can deliver and we know 
when we can deliver it. So we don't make obscene prompts. Um, which is important. I think. I mean, I think that's important. I think you can promise someone the world, but that doesn't mean you can deliver it. And and, and I think for us, like our projects have been very realistic with uh, timelines that have been met. So, terrific. Like the other day, like we, we, we went to AOS and we just built that prototype hand table, the tracking hand table, and we got it done, you know, a week before we were flying out to Las Vegas. So, that's not an easy task. I mean, but, but we knew the timeline in front of us and we met it. So I think that's important for startups to do that. Like, because investors it's, watch that. They're like, it's really important. Yeah. Timeline. It's really important, Greg. The, the, I see a lot of startups make the mistake of having brilliant ideas for, for products, but they don't know how to execute. And I, and I think the execution piece is actually more valuable than the, the original idea. Uh, it's that's a special team that can hit milestones over and over again uh, and get get over hurdles that they don't even know about yet. That's that's good stuff. So where where are you? Uh, how do you think you're you're going to sell this uh, fourth quarter or, or 2020? Have you thought about? We're looking to launch. We're looking to launch formally at the academy, uh, the Hand Academy in uh, Las Vegas in September. Okay. And that's wow. not formally going to be distributed. So, so we've got a manufacturer. Um, the nice thing is we're not, we don't have to pound out huge amounts of volume, er, volume early. We certainly want the project to be launched so that you know we know that everything's working appropriately and that our investors and uh, uh, that our customers are getting what they expect. Uh, we certainly want to value their feedback. But the nice thing about it, once you get FDA. Once we get FDA, we can then unfreeze design and make some iterations uh, within the confines of our clearance to make it more ergonomic, to make it smaller, uh, to basically take some feedback from our user and uh, and change it. So this is going to be a constantly changing thing. I mean, you wouldn't dare buy an iPhone 1 now, <laughs> now that you had the iPhone 8 or the 10, right? So, right, right. No, it's I mean, typical. Yeah, Gen 1 is never the, the product that you sell all over the world. It's turns into Gen 2 and Gen 3, and it just gets better all the time. Wait. The thing I can tell you is is our, our Gen 1, our, you know, our current device right now is awesome. I've used it in the operating room. It's great. It does everything I need to do. Uh, so I'm very excited about that, and I, and I know it's reliable because the FDA mandates that it's super reliable and it's super, you know, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost borderline indestructible. I mean, they've done drop testing on this that I don't, I don't think you could break it in the OR unless you, wow. you know, throw it off a building. I mean, I, I, I've seen some of the, the, the tolerances this thing is passing, and I don't even think it's physically possible to break it right now in the OR. But anyway, those are, these, are, these are good problems to have. Um, and, and then you really start – it becomes fun because you're like, okay, we, we have talks with manufacturers of plastic and – you know, shock absorbers, and we're, we're using this pla- the outer shell is made of a plastic that is from a, one of our engineers that I knew 12 years ago. Went to he was a um, textile engineer. You know, he 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 made that introduction for us. So it's it's really fun to to take input from people in all different fields. It's not just electrical engineering or mechanical engineering thing, or even a software thing. It's a textile engineering. It's a polymer thing. It's a in some ways, it's a nuclear uh, thing. I mean, there's uh, there's all sorts of there's all sorts of um, um, fields that come into this, and I'm you know, I'm just it, it, it's been a lot of fun to to hear different points of view. Well, this is this is terrific. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, we'll certainly look for this in the future. So how would a hand surgeon kind of get more information about micro C before the FDA clearance? What, what's the best place to go? Well, I would love to, I would love to tell people on the website, but that's just too, too slow. I mean, if you, if you want it, if you want to know about the micro C, you just email me. Uh, I appreciate your time. Thanks, Miriam, also. And, uh, we're close by, so I actually may stop by your office one day and see it in person. And let, yeah, let me know. Me let me. You guys think of how I can help you. I'll be happy to help you in any way. 
Uh, love the disruptive space where you're solving a problem nobody else has solved. I've, I've never done surgery, but I've been in cadaver labs all over the world and surgeries all over the world, and I cannot believe the size of the sea arm that gets wheeled around for, for hand or foot you know, operations. It uh, blows my mind. Yeah, absolutely. Make, makes no sense. All right, Lane. Well, thanks, thanks, Greg. Thanks, Miriam.